Good morning and welcome to Old Fort Niagara. My name is Robert Emerson. I'm the Executive Director of the Old Fort Niagara Association. This will be our final distance learning program in the series. Um, we do look forward to reopening the fort uh, in the very near future. Uh, so um, we appreciate you being with us for these, I think, 12 episodes in all. Today we're going to wrap up by talking about World War I. We're finally going to be entering the 20th century. So let's go to the slides at this point. So Fort Niagara in World War I, training ground for the Great War. Well, World War I to people today is a very distant and faded memory. Uh, backing up the words of historian John Moser, here's just a couple of pictures. Um, when I was a, a little kid, there were still a, a good many World War I vets around. Uh, the picture on the left is Roy, my grandmother's cousin, who used to come to our house for extended periods of time, and he was full of stories, having served in France uh, during the First World War. On the right is a picture of one of our Memorial Day observances, and it was interesting that the, the, the older men on the reviewing stand were not World War II veterans, they were World War I veterans back in the 60s. Um, a lot of the World War II veterans were in their 40s then, so the guys who really ran the local American Legion post in our town were World War I veterans. So I do remember them, um, but today they're all gone. Uh, so we have to look back and, and see what was going on here at Fort Niagara, uh, where men were training for service in France. All right, well, a little bit of background first. Um, the war gets touched off when the Austrian Archduke Fr uh, Franz Ferdinand is assassinated by this uh, sort of smarmy looking fellow, Gavrilo Princip, he was an anarchist. And this precipitated uh, the First World War, ultimately. There's a whole intricate system of alliances that turned this from a regional conflict into a world war. So the war breaks out in Europe in 1914, and the US remains neutral. Here's what the European landscape looked like. You can see the central powers there in orange uh, versus the allies, uh, shown in green. Well, a, couple, a few things happened to suck the US into the First World War. First is the sinking of the liner Lusitania in 1915. But uh, still, Woodrow Wilson, President Woodrow Wilson, campaigned in the 1916 election uh, on the platform that he, he'll keep us out of the war. U.S. attention was far more focused on the Mexican border at that time, where Mexican raiders were entering uh, the American Southwest, and the army was uh, in pursuit of Pancho Villa. And this is not Pancho Villa, it's an actor playing Pancho Villa, but he looks the part. Nonetheless, um, the powers uh, that be in the U.S. were, were preparing for conflict. In, in June of 1916, they passed the National Defense Act, for one thing, that um, began the Reserve Officer Training Corps, and uh, it provided for uh, nationalization of the National Guard and authorizing the president to federalize them and send them overseas. Uh, more things happened to uh, hasten the entry of the, the U.S. into the war. The Zimmerman telegram in January of 1917, this is between Germany and Mexico, uh, Mexico is promised some southwestern territory if they, uh, if they support the Germans. This did not go over at all well. Then in February, just a month later, Germany uh, declared unrestricted submarine warfare, where they're going to be sinking more vessels, including U.S. vessels. So finally, in uh, April, war, April 1917, war is declared by the United States. They authorized conscription, meaning the draft, and they thought there would be opposition to the war. Um, you can see here two posters. Uh, well, one's a poster, one's a piece of sheet music. Uh, one is pro-war, the other is anti-war. But in the end, uh, enthusiasm for U.S. entry into the war was high. By October, U.S. troops are entering the trenches in France. 
but it isn't till really the next spring in 1918 that U.S. troops get involved in major combat. The battles of Chateau Thierry and the first U.S. offensive is at Contigny, France. And uh, interestingly enough, connection to Fort Niagara here, the 28th Infantry Regiment was involved in that assault. They're, they were part of the first U.S. Division. And the 28th came here to Fort Niagara after the war and were here quite a while, garrisoning uh, the post here um, in the interwar years. So World War I involved 70 million combatants. There were nine to 12 million people killed in this conflict. So in the summer of 1918, there's a series of battles involving US troops. Bella Wood, uh, the Marne, Amiens, um, and then into the fall, Saint Mihiel, and uh, the Meuse Argonne, uh, in the, uh, ending up the, uh, the fighting for the US. And you can see here on this map, these are the major US operations in France. The little blue arrows show you where along this front, the US troops were, were deployed and used in offensive actions. And on November 11th, 1918, the war ends. Uh, we still celebrate Armistice Day today as Veterans Day in the United States. The war was terrible. It took a terrible toll. And that's because um, this is really the first heavy scale industrial war. There are airplanes, there are tanks, um, there are ex uh, extensive use of barbed wire. But most casualties are, ca are caused by rapid firing artillery and machine guns. Because of these devastating weapons, uh, the war turned very quickly in 1914 into a war of position. Uh, everybody dug into the ground, uh, elaborate systems of trenches were created as shown here. And it really, the, with the, the firepower of these weapons, uh, the defense, uh, it was necessary to dig these trenches to, to mount a good defense. So these trenches are gonna play a part in our story as we come back, but this is where the trench warfare of World War I uh, began shortly after uh, the hostilities commenced by September of 1914. Well, the American army in 1914 was very small, about 125,000 men, and a lot of these, uh, units were dispersed in garrisons all over the place, including uh, recently acquired U.S. possessions overseas. So some regiments hadn't even been together in any one place. They were dispersed among different garrisons. They were more of a constabulary, and they were serving in faraway places like the Philippines and in Panama. And weaknesses in the U.S. Army included uh, a dearth of officers, NCOs, and soldiers. Uh, arms and equipment were lacking, and U.S. industries at that time were not geared for war production. British General Basil Little Hart called the U.S., quote, a giant armed with a pen knife. We had the 16th largest army behind that of Portugal. Now, uh, U.S. had relied on a couple of big oceans to uh, protect it from overseas conflicts, but in 1914, army leaders realized that isolation was no longer a barrier, and they began to lobby for an expansion of the army. So the army goes from 125,000 to 4 million men in about 19 months. That's a huge, huge expansion. So in 1914, um, we're missing a picture here, um, but in 1914, Fort Niagara is garrisoned by the 2nd Battalion of the 29th Infantry Regiment. And what they are doing is training for border preparedness. Again, the Mexican border was a trouble spot, uh, and that's what the Army is focused on. Here we can see the French castle with some modern Army tents in the foreground. So, in 1917, Fort Niagara is selected to train uh, reserve officer uh, candidates. Now, the, the ROTC program traces its lineage back to about 1819, 
And then um, in 1913, uh, General Leonard Wood created a training camp for uh, officer candidates at Plattsburgh, New York, called the Plattsburgh Movement. And they're training about 16,000 men. But it wasn't until 1916 that ROTC was created by the National Defense Act. Well, the fort needs to get in shape for this big officer training camp. They have to erect nine buildings, 300 feet by 20 feet long. They build four mess halls, accommodations for 2,500 men, and they got it all done in a few weeks. Well, a local newspaper uh, reported uh, on this camp, another happy camp in prospect at Fort Niagara. Historic military post is to have another happy camp that is what the first camp here for the training of men for commissions was termed by a famous magazine writer because the men who learned the war game here were the happiest crowd of men he found at any of the training camps. And the men at the second camp are going to be just as happy a bunch as those that attended the preceding camp. This doesn't really sound like they're training for the first, the carnage of the First World War. It, the, the paper goes on, those that arrived yesterday began to get acquainted soon after their arrival. Before night, it was a big, happy family. Many of the men were friends before coming here, and it did not take long to get acquainted all around. The men in camp are already planning singing classes for their leisure hours. Singing was a big feature of the first camp. So there's two camps, and they're both 90 days long. Uh, first one goes in the summer, the second one uh, from August into the fall. Now, the government was very concerned about the moral integrity of the soldiers. So one of the orders that was given, any man seen coming from a saloon or questionable resort will be immediately discharged from camp. So I don't know how this affected the uh, establishments in Youngstown, but uh, that was forbidden. So what did the training consist of at these two 90-day camps? Well, first of all, the men learned signaling. This is, these are semaphore flags that were used to send signals. Here's another uh, photo of the men uh, learning semaphore signaling. They took long marches into the countryside to train them uh, for endurance. Boxing, who's gonna win here? Um, my money's on the short guy, I don't know, but um, Boxing was, was a popular sport at the camp. And by the way, these are all photos of uh, men who were actually here at Fort Niagara, taken here at Fort Niagara. There were inspections, more inspections. This photo was taken uh, along the service road south of the fort. You can just see where the old fort is there at the tip of land uh, where the Coast Guard station is today. So these men are lined up for inspection in a recognizable part of Fort Niagara State Park today. And this is what they were being inspected for. This is the stateside field kit for the Army, a wool uniform uh, campaign hat. Uh, once they got to Europe, um, these were not practical in the trenches. So they traded them in for the dishpan steel helmets that we're familiar with. Um, but you have your pack, you have your rifle, your bayonet and all the parts there are labeled. Calisthenics, an important part of the training. Bayonet drill. And here are the instructions to what to do with your bayonet. Bring the liver out on the bayonet. Bring the kidney out. Bring his breakfast out. So why are they doing bayonet drill in the age of machine guns and rapid firing artillery? Uh, it's be considered almost a useless weapon. However, U.S. Army doctrine uh, stated that the rifleman is the most important offensive weapon. And that, that doctrine was supported by the commander of the American Expeditionary Force, whose name was General John Pershing, shown here. These doctrines are based on fighting Native Americans, Spanish, and Filipinos in the last wars. The school here at Fort Niagara emphasize close order drill, personal hygiene, uh, care of arms and equipment, and military courtesies. But I think one of the most interesting parts of the, the training camps here at Fort Niagara was the creation of a whole system of 
European style trenches where Fort Niagara Beach is today. Here we see men in the second camp digging these European style trenches with picks and shovels. And here's more, more photos of the men entrenching, still more entrenching, entrenching 101. And this is a blueprint that shows how this trench system was created. Lake Ontario's there at the top. This is what it looked like um, from above. The American trench lines are on the right and the German trench lines on the left. And the men could actually practice trench warfare, which was completely new to US troops at this point. They could practice trench warfare on, uh, in this trench system that was built on the beach. There's a, another blueprint um, showing how the trenches were, were laid out. There's a cross section and an aerial photograph. Um, you now, if you look at this photograph in the extreme top left corner, you'll see the North Redoubt inside old Fort Niagara. So that gives you an idea where this trench system was, was erected, where the pool area and the beach uh, are today. Here are some, they built artillery pits, obstacle courses. The Geneva Times, uh, Geneva, New York Daily Times said that since 1812, the fort was, has been a quiet place, but now it's a bustling place with soldiers going here, there, and everywhere. But not everybody was happy. The newspaper article aside, this was the, 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 the company M of the 3rd New York National Guard was the service company that had to keep the base running while these soldiers, these ROTC candidates were trained. And some of the men from the ROTC camp looked down on these New York National Guardsmen. One of them, uh, uh, according to an article, made, uh, made him carry his big heavy trunk from the trolley station all the way into the barracks. He didn't like that. Uh, another one made him wash his little dog. So there was definitely some, some kind of class resentment going on here, according to newspaper articles of the time. The men did have uh, leisure time where they could uh, rest and do uh, things they wanted. One of the highlights of the camps was an August performance by Nora Bays. We see her here on stage at Fort Niagara. Now, who's Nora Bays? She was one of the most popular vaudeville singers of the time. In fact, if you want to compare uh, a, today's generation to that of 100 years ago, Nora Bays would be the equivalent of maybe Beyonce today, somebody that you would recognize. She, uh, she was the first to record the popular song Over There, which you heard during the introduction. It wasn't her voice, but she did record that, that tune. Uh, she co-wrote Shine On Harvest Moon, which was an immensely popular song at the time. So Nora Bays, if you had been around in 1917, you would have known her name. And she was here. So uh, it's interesting, we have in our, in our archives uh, letters from these candidates that were here, getting pretty cold around here, campus now half over, next week we'll spend a half week in the trenches at a physical test today, I think I passed okay. That's Will Swanson. Now, this uh, individual named Jack Shevlin, he was very, very close to his sister. And he sent her a ton of postcards from Fort Niagara. And he would tell her what was going on here. And we're fortunate enough to have this collection of postcards in our archives. Uh, so we have the photo and th the message that was written on the back of it. This is the finished front entrance of a gun pit. The gun is back out of sight. You'll observe how strongly revetted the pit is. This affords some protection to the gun crew. Jack Shevlin again, this is our Saturday morning job, pitching shelter tents and spreading our equipment inside for inspection. There are two men to a tent. Each one carries half the tent in his role. Here's Jack Shevlin with uh, semaphore. This is kind of amusing. There are two systems of signaling in the Army, Semaphore and Morris International. I took the latter. I will teach you when I return so that when we are out card playing, we may use our dots and dashes to beat the enemy. 
Um, here's another one. Let's say that I enjoyed the feed very much. He got a care package from his parents. I saved it all for the trenches and it gave me two good big dinners. I divided the cake with some of the boys in my squad. I have a Swedish following in my squad who raved over the skorpa. Here you see some, some men chowing down. Ed uh, writes to uh, a woman he knew. Uh, it's raining and I intend to spend this hour writing to my school friends. This is the old barracks. Now this, this barracks was outside Old Fort Niagara. It's over near where the officers club is today, a little bit east of there. I'm going to send Jimmy a picture of my home and you will see it then. This is a great life if you don't weaken. I think Paul won't care if I write you this. Well, we don't know what's going on there, but obviously Ed and Paul may be rivals. Jack Shevlin again, uh, some of the members on Bayonet practice on dummies. This is the highest obstacle in the series, which you didn't see. It's fun jump when you have a pack on your back. It's a case of the bigger they come, the harder they fall. Jack Shevlin had a, a, a really nice sense of humor, I think, in writing to his sister. Now, this is an interesting, this is a photograph after one of the sham battles that they, uh, that they practiced in the trench system on the beach. And uh, Jack Shevlin says, Colonel Kearney says that this picture is the most realistic that has been taken in the camp. The fatalities of the assault, as you see, are laying around. These men were numbered, and when your number was called, you fell. Here's where we spend four hours each day this week. I shot 40 out of a possible 50 in, this 500, in the 500 range this afternoon, just fair. This is the rifle range, a thousand yard rifle range. Um, this was located where the soccer fields are today. This may be my favorite pastime this week. The boys have to sketch the post and turn in the drawing for official rating. It snowed flurries all morning. This is the second camp. It's getting into, into fall now. Here's a picture. We were lucky to uh, uh, track down uh, Jack Shevlin's grandson who had some family pictures. And here's Jack with his two sisters, Catherine and Margaret. And here they are with Jack in uniform in 1917 or 1918. Well, these 90 day training camps were not universally popular among the army brass. Uh, Major General William Snow said that each was distinguished for its wholly inadequate course of instruction, its incompetent instructors, and its insufficient equipment. He does not look amused. Well, the camps wrap up in the fall of 1917, and we have all these barracks that are, have been built, and they're standing pretty much empty at this point. So what happens next is elements of the Polish Blue Army come to Fort Niagara. Now the Polish Blue Army, they were Poles who were being trained to fight on the Western Front. They were given uh, old French uniforms, which were blue. So that's where they get their name. Uh, most of them are over on the Canadian side, on the Niagara, on the lake side of the Niagara River, but they have too many men. So the overflow is sent to Fort Niagara in December. Um, so they are accommodated here uh, for about three months into February. About 1,772 Polish troops at Fort Niagara for a very short time. The next group that moves in after the Polish Blue Army is out is in 1918, and this is called the Federal Guard. These are men who are too old or not physically um, fit enough to be in the, 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 men, the, the ranks of the men going overseas. So some of them are stationed here at Fort Niagara. And this is when the Spanish flu hits. Um, Spanish flu, devastating pandemic. And uh, this is a newspaper article. Um, about seven soldiers here at Fort Niagara died from the Spanish flu, which was running rampant in 1918-1919. So the US Guard uh, leaves Fort Niagara and they go to Fort Dix uh, after, after they're here. So now, 
the barracks are pretty much empty. So since June of 1917, about 10,000 men were handled in and out of Fort Niagara. Uh, in the fall, men even uh, assisted local farmers with their fruit harvest. It's estimated they picked $100,000 worth of fruit that would have spoiled because of course of the lack of available labor at that time. Now let's take a little tour around the post. This was the officer's club in uh, 1917. It burned down in the 1930s and was replaced by the officer's club that we, we know today. The post headquarters was right just south of the officer's club. Captains were uh, billeted in these homes. Uh, lieutenants were billeted in duplex housing. And then the enlisted men, here are the barracks. And as I said, these barracks, uh, none of them uh, stand anymore uh, from, from the World War I period. But you can see they're sort of the classic army style of architecture. That's the uh, oldest one in the picture, uh, built in the 19th century. A more recent barracks buildings. Here's a, a view inside one of the enlisted men's barracks. Now here's a, here's a blueprint of all these new barracks they had to build to accommodate the influx of these thousands of officer training candidates. And um, if we look here, that's where they were located in Fort Niagara State Park. If you see the, um, the old fort is off to the left and you see the big white square there, that's the pool parking lot today. And then of course that traffic circle uh, located, uh, it was just about located where these World War I barracks stood uh, in 1917. And there's an aerial view uh, that you can really see. You can see the trench system off in the distance, some hospital buildings, barracks, mess halls, and then off to the left are the old brick barracks that we saw pictures of a few moments ago. Here's the post exchange and the interior of the PX, that stood uh, a little further to the south uh, in what's now the park, of course. The quartermaster storehouse, which actually had a connection with the, with the trolley uh, rail system, so they could bring supplies in. That's the hospital building that stood over closer to where the pool is today. So let's wrap up. The American Expeditionary Force was in combat for about 150 days. They seized 485 square miles of enemy held territory, captured 63,000 prisoners. The United States made a significant contribution to Allied victory in World War I. The cost of that was 116,708 deaths, and some of that was battle inflicted other was uh, disease, of course, the Spanish flu playing a big part in that casualty rate. Over 200,000 men were wounded in World War I, many uh, receiving life-changing wounds that would plague them for the rest of their lives. So um, we're just gonna wrap up now uh, with this cartoon. Uh, this is a cartoon from 1918, and it certainly does predict the future. So thanks very much. We'll go to questions now. All right. Uh, what were the, I had a question here. What were the, we saw what the strength of the U.S. force was. What were the other uh, countries involved? Well, how, how big were their armies? Well, uh, the Germans mobilized about 11 million men during the course of the war, which in Europe, it was a four year long war. The British um, mobilized about 8.9 million soldiers. The French about 8.4. Uh, so, you know, comparatively, the U.S. force, it was a large force, but it did not equal the size of the other Western European countries that were involved in the conflict. All right. Um, did the U.S. turn the tide of the war? Well, historians argue about this. Um, most American historians believe that yes, you had 
uh, an influx of U.S. troops, fresh troops. Uh, keep in mind that in 1918, when the U.S. soldiers really got into action, the Europeans had been fighting for four long years, and the fatigue of war was weighing heavily on them. So these U.S. troops, even though they uh, were in many cases inexperienced, thrown into combat early, um, not equipped necessarily in the best manner, um, they did help to turn the tide of the war in 1918 and uh, deliver Allied victory. Lou and Logan have a question. Just go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, was Fort Niagara Oops, sorry. two? I'm sorry, do that again. Was, was Fort Niagara used in World War II? That's an excellent question. Yes, it was. It was used for different things in World War II. Uh, the first thing that it was used for in World War II was as an induction center. So civilians joining the army would come here and they would, they would get their physicals, they would do paperwork, and this, is, this was their first real taste of military life for most Western New Yorkers. So the induction center was where you entered the army. Then uh, after that, uh, later in the war, there was a pretty large prisoner of war camp here from 1944-1945, and about 2,800 uh, German and Austrian prisoners of war were, were held here. Um, far from the action, of course. And many of them, just like we saw in World War I with US soldiers helping the local farmers, many of the German POWs uh, went out and helped uh, local farmers harvest their crops because again, there's a shortage of labor. So those were the primary things that Fort Niagara did during World War II. Did World War I have a nickname? Well, it had a couple of names. We call it World War I today because we know that there was a World War II. I think the generation that fought World War I hoped, sincerely hoped that there would not be a World War II. Uh, and at the time, a lot of people referred to the conflict as the Great War because it, 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 it's immense size. Think about you know, millions and millions and millions of combatants. So they called it the Great War. And optimistically, um, when the war was over, uh, they also called it the war to end all wars. Well, we saw how that worked out. All right. Um, what? Here's a question. What about the Russians? What happened to the Russians? Well, they were involved. Of course, when the war broke out in 1914, the Russians were under the leadership of the Tsar. But uh, in 1917 came the Bolshevik Revolution. And we'll get back to that in a minute. But what this did for Germany and Austria, Hungary, who were the uh, central powers, this meant that they had to fight a two front war. They had a war in the East and a war in the West. Uh, so this was tough, but the Germans were able to defeat the Russians uh, pretty early on. And then the Bolshevik Revolution occurred and Russia pulled out of the war because they had their own internal problems going on. Of course, the Tsar is deposed and killed and the family, etc. So this releases all kinds of German troops to move to the Western Front. So yeah, the Russians had a, a big role to play in the war, but they did not finish the war. Uh, it concentrated more on the Western Front at that point. So we're out of time. Thanks for your attention. Uh, again, this is the last in our series, and uh, we're gonna be hopefully reopening very soon. Watch our website, oldfortniagara.org, for that announcement as to specific times and programs. Also Facebook. Social media. And Facebook as well. So thanks a lot. It's been nice uh, chatting with you these past few weeks, and uh, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. I gotta say, Logan had great questions the entire 
two series. Every, every great, session. Great questions. Good job, buddy. Every session. Thanks.